Okay, we we'll get. I watch this 29. Does anybody have another time? Add them all up and average them. 27. Uh, if I don't shake it, it sometimes doesn't go at all, and that could be the session to theory and practice of scheduling. The first disaster that happened to me today is that I, and it's all my own fault, I scheduled myself for four separate uh, sessions of one kind or another, which I think is the most teaching I've done in one day since World War II. And secondly, there seems to be a certain indeterminacy about the local scheduling system that made it fluctuate between 3 and 3.30. Anyway, here we all are, and it's 3.30, and we all think that's the time to begin, so I will. Uh, I think a major function of these sessions is for faculty members to talk about their current research, and, uh, what kinds of things they are up to, so you can get some acquaintance with the range of research that goes on in this uh, institution. <coughs> As uh, most of you know, I spend a good part of my life over in the psychology department practically mo most of my life in the psychology department since my secretary is there. Um, and I have an office over here that I can hide out in. And on the 27th, which I guess is a week from today, uh, we're going to have another session uh, which John Anderson is uh, taking charge of, also from psychology, also a joint member of both departments. And I You're right, I knew that too, right. Yeah, okay. On the 5th of October, another session that uh, John Anderson will chair. And I think the presence of these two sessions on the program uh, illustrates what we think around here about the relation between artificial intelligence on the one hand uh, and modern psychology, modern cognitive psychology on the other hand. Uh, we think that they can't really live very well without each other. And there seem to be increasing number of other people who share that view uh, to the point that uh, there has even been formed a uh, society of cognitive science. What's its official name? Do we know? Cognitive Science Society. Cognitive Science Society. That was pretty close. Uh, which uh, bundles up uh, uh, in its uh, boundaries uh, AI types, uh, cognitive psychologists, psycholinguists, a few stray physiologists, I guess, neurophysiologists, um, some philosophers, let me think right, and so on. It's not quite clear whether that society will do all the things that an artificial intelligence society needs to do, and I gather that's still up for grabs. All right. But at any rate, there's a long history now, a 25-year history, uh, a very close relation uh, between AI and cognitive simulation, that is to say, between people who are interested in getting computers to do smart things, which is the way I would define AI, and people are, who are interested in finding out how human beings do smart and sometimes dumb things, uh, which I would define as the task of cognitive psychology. And it's just turned out that some of the time at least, not always, some of the time when you want to get a computer to do smart things, it's a good idea to first find out how human beings do those things and see if there are any ideas you can borrow. And similarly, some of the time, when you want to figure out how human beings do smart things, it's useful to look around and see if there are any computers doing those kinds of things and see whether the computers are doing them in peculiarly pecul computer-like ways or whether some of the ideas uh, used in the computer programs are related to the way in which human beings do those things. And so we've had a development, for example, of, of a theory of uh, heuristic search, which has to do with how intelligent systems find rare objects in large spaces without looking interminably. And this theory of heuristic search appears to be both highly relevant to artificial intelligence systems. Most, most successful artificial intelligence systems uh, have embedded in them, heuristic search of one side or another, but it's also turned out to be highly 
relevant to psychology because it turns out that uh, human beings often find themselves in enormous problem-solving spaces, and the only way they ever get to the other side of the field is by some kind of highly selective heuristic search. So here's an example where the two fields have had good reason to stay together. In deciding what one should be researching about at any given point of time, and that of course changes from time to time, I guess a good question to ask is, what are the big open research questions? Well, some people would be inclined to ask about artificial intelligence, what are the closed questions? What, uh, what if anything, do we know? I think we know a great deal. Um, I think we do a lot of bad mouthing of ourselves in artificial intelligence. It's not so bad as it was about five years ago, but we still are a little too modest about what we do. Some people in the field are modest about what they do. Um, I think we know a great deal about how problem solving can be done in domains uh, where there isn't a large amount, there isn't an enormous amount of task-specific information that has to be handled and processed. Uh, that's the domain of puzzle-like problems, for example. I think we know an awful lot about the solution of solving puzzle-like uh, problems. Not that we always do it well, uh, but in the sense that I think we have uh, a good structure of theory uh, about it, uh, part of which you can find in a book like uh, Nelson's uh, uh, textbook. It's a little old now, but uh, others coming along. You can find a body of theory. In what sense a body of theory? Well, there aren't very many theorems, and that makes mathematicians sometimes unhappy because mathematicians somehow confuse those two words. They are spelled almost alike, but uh, theories aren't necessarily theorems. There are an awful lot of theories around the world of empirical phenomena that are formalized to varying degrees of, of formality. And I think one would have to say that, that the theory of problem solving in information sparse domains is not highly formalized in that sense. We've got a, a few theorems about search algorithms. We have some things called A star and B star, best first algorithms. Um, and we know a few things about them, and we can even prove a few things about them. But I think the heart of the progress and the heart of our knowledge uh, does not reside in those theorems, however useful they may be. The heart of our knowledge resides in the fact that we know enough about the nature of problem solving and intelligence in these domains that we can actually build systems that sometimes solve problems. And by and large, that tends to be the, the test uh, of our knowledge in the field of artificial intelligence. Now that can be a, a deceptive test sometimes because uh, we would like knowledge that can be transferred to new problems. And there's always a danger, unless we pay particular attention to the issue, there's always a danger that we'll build this system, we'll build that system, we'll build the other system, and each one will run. And when we build the fourth system, we'll have to learn all over again what it is that makes the system run. Well, I don't think we're quite as badly off at that uh, anymore. I don't think anybody who builds a new system now for solving problems will do so without being aware of and trying to make use of the fact that there is something called best first search or there is something called means ends analysis uh, or that if life gets very difficult, you can always fall back on generate and test and see whether that will do anything for you. We have at least a taxonomy of problem solving methods. We know how any one of you, I trust, uh, maybe I ought to wait a week before saying this, uh, any one of you could go out and build a system that had some form of means ends analysis embedded in it and so on. Or if you couldn't, you will by the end of this semester. So we have that, uh, uh, we, we do so know something about that. Uh, we also know something about the range of alternatives that are open to us with respect to memory organization and with respect to languages. Uh, you can organize memory in any way you want, but if you're writing an artificial intelligence program, it'll always turn out to be some kind of a list structure memory, uh, alias a semantic network, uh, alias a directed graph, uh, now, there are about 16 different names for what is basically the same idea, an idea that's been around for a very long time. And we've learned that, uh, that uh, if you're trying to 
organize a memory for a system that's going to have to behave under all sorts of unexpected circumstances, unexpected to it. Uh, and it's going to have to store away all sorts of information where it can't predict in advance what kinds of information it's going to store. You're probably going to end up with a memory like that. And correspondingly, I think we've learned about languages uh, that uh, uh, we want some combination of uh, a list la processing language and a production system language. I'm not suggesting these are mutually exclusive, which they're not. Uh, but uh, uh, these are two of the central ideas that have emerged from artificial intelligence research. I well, should be careful. Production systems, of course, didn't come out of artificial intelligence research. This language is did. Uh, but they're two of the central ideas that everybody knows who's going to build an artificial intelligence uh, intelligent system. When we move to problem solving in domains where there's much more information to be processed, uh, semantically rich domains, uh, standard example, the medical diagnosis problem. Um, we could talk a long time about, about chess, whether it belongs in this category or the previous one, but I think chess is probably best regarded as being a semantically rich domain today in the way in which we go about building programs for that. Uh, then we get into a, another set of problems. Uh, that we have learned a good deal about, but still have much to learn about. One is, again, what are the ways of representing knowledge in a system? Um, do we model the system? Do we build a model of it so we can actually run the model and see how it uh, would go? Uh, do we put the information in as some sort of a relational network? Uh, do we, uh, 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 do we uh, try to construct some sort of causal analysis of the relations among the pieces of knowledge in the system and build up some kind of a causal network as some of the diagnostic systems have, uh, or what? We've had experience with at least a modest range of these representations. We know something about where they're good and where, where they aren't good and what they can be uh, used for. We know something, but not as much as we need to, about control structures. Uh, we know that at least for simulating the kinds of things human beings can do in rich domains, that the control structure of, of uh, pyramided, hierarchical, closed subroutines, the traditional programming format, uh, tends to be a little bit inflexible. Not that you can't do anything that can be done uh, with such uh, structures. We're not arguing the Turing machine argument, but that it turns out, in fact, to be not very conducive to programs that are fairly flexible and open in responding to uh, environments that are changing all the time. And so there's been at least a good college try over the past five years uh, at using control structures associated with production systems. In the primitive production systems, those were very simple control structures. All you did was to line up all your instructions as a list of productions, and then you fired the first one that, that waved its hand that had its condition satisfied, and then the next one. Well, that didn't turn out to be completely satisfactory. And so now we have other ideas uh, embedded, for example, in the OPS2 system, which uh, you'll get acquainted with around here. We have other ideas about uh, what should determine the priority of productions firing in a production system. But still, systems that are freer and looser than the kind that we used to write with respect to how much of the control we impose consciously and deliberately at the moment we are programming them. Uh, I'm sort of going down the list in the order of our ignorance, that is, most knowledge first and most ignorance last, as you can see, I think, from the, right? uh, In semantically rich domains, we very frequently want to be able, for a variety of reasons, to communicate with human beings in natural language. Sometimes we want to communicate orally, and that's what hearsay and harpy were all about, but even if we want to communicate in writing, we want to communicate in natural language. And there are all sorts of systems around which will handle various uh, little chunks of natural language. I don't think anybody at the moment is claiming they have a system around which just handles free English as it's coming out of me now, for example. Uh, that still seems to be a little bit beyond the state of the art. And for that reason, natural language understanding uh, remains a uh, very active and a very productive area of, of research kinds of parsers that I see around each year are a little better than the ones last year. Is that still true, Mark? <laughs> uh, 
No, it isn't your problem so much as uh, uh, see Cosi around here. Um, but they aren't all that we want, but uh, but they are coming along. Now, getting to still more uh, open problems, uh, we feel very heavily, I think, in artificial intelligence, the burden of transferring human knowledge into the computer. I'm not sure that our reaction here is at all justified. After all, if we look at the process of transferring human knowledge into human beings, that's really not one of the more efficient processes that exists. I won't ask all of you how many years you've been going to school, uh, but you know, it's been a long, long process. I wonder whether there's been any computer which has been in intake mode for as many hours as you've sat just uh, sat in lectures or read books in the course of your lives. So maybe we're, we're uh, unrealistic <laughs> when we think that somehow or other there should be a painless way of getting information into computers in order to turn them, say, into good medical diagnosticians or something like that. And we may be kidding ourselves even more in thinking that if there is a more painless way, a less painful way, that that way is to use natural language. That may be a snare and a delusion, the idea that if we could just talk to the computer the way I'm talking to you, suddenly it would become a wise computer. Uh, I'm sure you will become wise, but I'm not sure about the computer. Um, nevertheless, there is a strong feeling in the artificial intelligence community <coughs> that we ought to be able to talk to our computers. And that seems to me as good a reason as any for uh, continuing a good pace of natural language uh, understanding uh, research. Uh, sorry, I, I intended to make an additional point on that. Not only natural language <coughs> understanding research, but research on how the computer can learn in some of the senses in which human beings learn. Because uh, when you read a textbook, I hope, you don't just uh, take in the sentences and parse them and store them. It's a terrible thing to do. Uh, known students who did that, but most of them flunked out of Carnegie kind of Mellon. Uh, there's some other process going on. There's some other more effective mode of storage. At the time that you're storing information from what you're reading, you are also storing various kinds of, uh, of access routes to that information. And in fact, the effectiveness of your reading depends much more on the strategies you have for reorganizing information as you read and for storing access routes than it does on how many pages an hour you can turn over uh, and, and glance at. So not only would we like to be able to communicate with the computer by natural language, uh, but it would be very nice if the computer, when natural language were presented to it, like a textbook, if the computer would do some of the intelligent intelligent processing that a clever person does uh, and would store that information not just as something that could be spewed out at ro by rote, but would store that information uh, in such a way that it could use it then to solve problems and, and deal with various contingencies. So learning seems to me to be a very uh, important uh, topic. And I'm going to say more about that because that's one of the areas in which I and others in the psychology department are currently engaged in, in research that I think is also relevant to AI. Uh, finally, uh, computers are of the past have been sensorially deprived in a variety of ways. They really had very little uh, interface with the outside world, you come to think of it. They don't have eyes, they don't have ears, and in a real sense they have a teletype or a typewriter, but that's not really a substitute for eyes and ears. Uh, and uh, they can't act on the world. They don't have motor organs. All they can do is to tell you what to do. They can't do it themselves, typically. Now, a whole new spate of problems arises when you try to build a computing system that will really interact with the world, and that's what I understand the term robotry to be all about. Uh, in my lexicon, a robot uh, is a system which um, uh, which has some kind of sensory organs, uh, which has some kind of motor organs, uh, and which has enough brains in between those two so that it can perform intelligent acts that require 
hand-eye coordination or the equivalent of that, coordination between the motor organs and the sensory organs. Uh, and uh, I mention that as a separate topic because I think that there are some branches of research that are involved in robotry which really don't come up in any salient form, at least, uh, in other aspects of artificial intelligence research. Uh, the first is that you really have to face up to the problem of building sensory organs uh, and uh, motor organs that will meet certain task demands. And if there's anything we've learned in the last 25 years, it's the, that it's a good deal harder to simulate the sensory and motor parts of a human being than it is uh, what's between his ears. Put in its most, uh, uh, in its starkest form, it's much easier to simulate a college professor than a bulldozer driver. Uh, we've made much more progress on simulating thinking, problem solving, all those good things, which I guess is what college professors do, uh, than we have in simulating this interaction with a rough environment, uh, sensing that environment, and controlling some sort of a device. Uh, not only a bulldozer driver, just walking across a rough field uh, would be a good enough uh, example. I could give you all sorts of rationalizations why that's so, but that isn't very important in the present context. What's important, I think, is that it is so, and that therefore, uh, robotry offers some uh, very challenging uh, problems in artificial intelligence research. They are being addressed now in very limited ways in industrial settings. Industrial robots are a great rage at the moment. And various people give us counts of how many there are in various countries in various months, and the numbers are in the thousands <coughs> by now. But a robot is still, an industrial robot, is still a very limited device. Um, which has limited sensory powers and limited effectors, and uh, in which very little of the known techniques of artificial intelligence are typically used in making the connections between the sensors and the effectors. I think existing robots uh, derive much more from the technology of, of feedback control systems, of servo mechanism systems, than they do of uh, artificial intelligence technology. Now, maybe that's in the nature of the beast. Maybe that will always be so, but I doubt it. I think a time will come when, and the time is arriving, when we will want robots to be sufficiently, uh, sufficiently uh, uh, bright so that they'll need something more than analog computers and, and uh, feedback controls in there as a substitute for brains when they'll really need to be able to do some sophisticated uh, processing. That's, some of you know there's already, of course, been research in that direction, which uh, Stanford's uh, uh, regretted uh, late uh, Shakey was a, a very good early example. And Shakey didn't do great things, but at least it was a thoughtful, uh, it was a thoughtful system that always planned out where it was going before it was going. How, how many of you have seen at least a movie of Shakey? Oh, not very many of you. Do we have a movie around that ought to be shown at some time? Probably so. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a more state-of-the-art system by now, but... Um, there's a system from the General Motors called Compact. <laughs> well, except for those remarks, I'm not going to say anything about robotry. I just wanted to, to emphasize that the particular topics I'm going to be talking about in the next hour, uh, which are the things that most of my research energy is going into now, uh, are not necessarily the only exciting processes, uh, only exciting topics that uh, are available for research in AI, although I think they're exciting topics or I wouldn't be doing them. Uh, but there are other alternatives for people to whom these don't appeal. Well, let me, oh, by the way, uh, I would welcome interruptions, comments, this or that, uh, questions even, if they're not too hard. <coughs> Any comments so far? <clears throat> and I turn now to my interests, and not just my interests, but interests of various groups of people located mainly in psychology, but also with some outposts here in, in computer science. Um, one thing we would like to know in semantically rich domains, that is domains where you have to have a lot of knowledge in order to perform, one of the things we'd like to know is what is the difference between an expert and a novice? Why is an expert expert and why is a novice a novice? 
And we now have a major project going on on expert and novice problem solving in physics. Uh, we're not going to try to find uh, the glue on, but we're operating the more uh, temperate levels of uh, college, first year college physics, or even advanced high school physics, something like that. <coughs> the people involved uh, uh, in this uh, are John McDermott, uh, Jill Larkin, my wife and I, plus various other associated people. And this field will illustrate uh, one of the typical ways, not the only way, but one of the typical ways in which people are going about exploring human cognitive processes these days. Uh, it's a very simple strategy, but it seems to work to some degree at least. The strategy is you first capture some novices and some experts, and you set them to work solving some problems, and you turn on a tape recorder while they're doing it, uh, and you get a, well, you ask them if they will please uh, talk aloud while they're doing it. You are purposefully vague about what you mean about talking aloud, because what you don't want is a subject, uh, a subject uh, giving you a theory of his problem solving processes. That would be as undignified as a Geiger counter getting up at a meeting of the American Physical Association and making a speech. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's the psychologist's job to find out what the theory is of the phenomena. It's the subject's job to simply do the task in front of him, to solve the problem in front of him. But most people, when they're solving problems, can talk. Some of us, even when we're by ourselves, while we're solving problems, do talk. Uh, we're sometimes a little shy about doing it when others are present. But most of us can talk a good deal. And you get a great deal of information uh, about the processes that people are using, and particularly about the stages they go through on the way to solving a complex problem. Now, I'll, I'll come back a little later and talk about the nature of that evidence um, and how you use that evidence. But for the moment, let's just say that the data we have is a thinking aloud protocol of some people who've been solving some problems. Some of these are novices and some of them are experts. At the same time, we try to write uh, one or several computer programs that are also capable of solving those problems, uh, not trying to make the computer as clever as possible, but trying to, as nearly as we can tell, uh, make use, making use of the, uh, trying to make use uh, of the kinds of processes that we think our novice and expert pro uh, subjects uh, are using. Let me give an illustration to make all of this more concrete. If I don't hang myself process. Uh, we might have a problem that involves a falling body. Uh, I'll talk mostly about kinematics problems. Uh, we have a falling body. Uh, a body, uh, I'll take the simplest sort of thing we could have, a body falls down a cliff 40 meters high, uh, and uh, the question is, uh, how long did it take? <coughs> well, a fairly simple system will do that problem, and in fact, we believe that our subjects have fairly simple systems for doing that, uh, doing a problem like that. Uh, they have stored in memory uh, a set of physics equations which represent the laws of kinematics. And actually, you only know, need three or four, because you can get by with three. Uh, most textbooks will give you seven or eight by playing changes on the forms of the equation. Uh, some I've never seen or never remember never having seen. Um, but at any rate, a very small number uh, of uh, uh, equations. And now all you have to do in order to solve that problem is to apply the appropriate ones of those equations in an appropriate order. Uh, and that turns out to be very simple too. Uh, and that is uh, that if you can find an equation which has n variables in it, of which you already know the variable, the values of n minus 1, then it wouldn't be a bad idea to solve that equation, because then you can get the value of one more variable. Um, so we could have an equation like s equals 1 half at squared, where a is a known constant. 
Uh, and in this problem, we know that we have uh, S, that's the distance the thing's going to fall. And we know we want T, so the thing to do is to solve it. Well, I think you can all see uh, how to build a, a production system that will do things like that. All you do is to put in the conditions of your, your productions the names of variables whose values, uh, which appear in the equation in question. And the condition for executing the instruction, the uh, production, might be something like uh, if uh, values are known for all but one of the variables, fire the production. In fact, that's pretty much the way our experts behave. And this is a well-known method of problem solving known as working forward. You take what you know and simply infer from it anything else you can infer until happy day you reach a point where you know the answer to your problem. Now, it needn't be so. In principle, it needn't be so. But it just turns out that with kinematics problems and a number of other domains we've looked at now, uh, in such domains, it turns out that uh, this scheme works just great. You solve problems in almost no time at all. Uh, a system program this way solves problems. Uh, you might ask, well, uh, isn't that, wouldn't it be better if it took account of what its goal was, what it was really trying to solve for, rather than just saying, I'll solve any equation where I know the values of all the variables at once. Uh, I simply report the fact that uh, these domains are so small that uh, after you solve two or at most three equations, you'll have the answer. And for the expert, this turns out to be more efficient than really thinking about what he's doing. Now, our novices do not behave this way. By novice, I mean somebody who can do algebra reasonably well. Uh, and who has studied the chapter in which these equa uh, equations occur. Uh, the novice, in fact, behaves as though he or she had a production system with the same possible actions, the equations, uh, S equals average velocity times time, terminal velocity equals acceleration times time, and so on. We're, uh, that chapter in the, in the textbook only deals with constant accelerations, of course. So things are kind of easy. The novice looks at that problem and says, what do I want to solve for? Well, I want to find t. Then, at least in some forms of the novice program, then looks for an equation with a t in it and tries to solve that equation. If there are other unknowns in the equation, those are put on the want list along with this original variable. And you look for other equations in which you might solve those. Now, this is also a well-known problem-solving method, uh, known sometimes as working backward. Sometimes as means-ends analysis. You know what your goal is. You ask yourself, do I know anything that might help me to that goal? You try to use that. You find you can't use it. So you set up the goal of using it, and then you ask, is there anything that can help me get to that goal, and so on. And that's all that's involved in this, uh, in this uh, simple little system. Now, it's kind of interesting, I guess, at least I find it interesting, uh, it's kind of interesting that all our lives, teachers have been telling us, I'm sure I've told students this, that uh, the intelligent way to go about solving problems is to work backwards. Figure out what your goal is, and then start setting up a a chain of events that will uh, get you to that goal, working backwards from that goal. And yet, we've now got very clear-cut evidence that, that uh, in these kinds of problem domains, working forward is the expert uh, strategy. So this kind of research can lead you to surprises. And I guess when we first found that, we were surprised. By now, we have a rationalization of it. And we can even qualify it a little bit. Rich? Probably. We don't know quite how to measure that efficiency at the moment. Uh, often, the working forward, you solve more equations. You, in fact, solve an extra equation or two. But uh, uh, we don't know exactly how to measure the efficiency, because we don't know 
at a detailed level, what processes are the ones that are taking the time? So, uh, don't know. There seems to be a certain efficiency in not having to think about what you're doing. <laughs> and I don't have that represented in the models uh, at present. Because um, in this, you do have to stash away on some kind of a pushdown list or something equivalent. You have to stash away your sub-goals and keep around sub-goals. Whereas this thing, you don't worry about sub-goals at all. You just do what comes naturally. Uh, and that may be the source of the efficiency. Now, we do find, we found this not in this domain, but in thermodynamics, we found experts doing the same thing, working forwards. But if you threw an extra hard problem at them, harder than they've been used to and were really gung-ho for, uh, then they switch to working backward mode. So the working forward mode has something to do with being in a task domain where you feel a certain assurance that if you just gather information, which is what working forward is, you just gather information, you'll get the answer to your problem. Uh, well, I mentioned this first as an illustration of what one looks at in this kind of psychological research. This particular example might have some interest uh, in artificial intelligence because we have that same that same dichotomy presented to us in building problem-solving programs of various kinds. Uh, there was a time when uh, I think, well, and maybe the time is not over, when I think AI problem-solving programs were dominated by the idea of means-ends analysis and best-first search. Uh, well, best-first search can be working forward, but means-ends analysis is certainly working backwards from a goal. Uh, and there is another viewpoint you can have. And that is that you solve problems by gathering information about the situation until the answer is obvious. And perhaps some of the more recent uh, game-playing programs can be interpreted as, as exhibiting this philosophy. Am I, am I doing you an injustice, uh, Hans? No, I think it's a good interpretation. No. Uh, now, I, I don't think we know very much about where this kind of tactic works and where it it doesn't work, but it does suggest a, uh, a new way of looking, or a different way at least. I don't think it's completely new. I think uh, I know people have been looking this way in some cases, at least since 1971. But uh, it is another way of looking at problem solving and may have some lessons that could feed back into uh, AI research. Um, it also is an uh, illustration of the fact that uh, in domains that are regarded as difficult for human beings, there aren't very many human beings who complain that college physics is too easy for them. And that in domains that are difficult for most human beings, uh, you can build rather simple production systems uh, that will perform those tasks expeditiously. Furthermore, uh, I talked about this when I introduced it as a semantically rich domain. Now, there are a lot of things to know about physics. But if you actually analyze the, the uh, content of textbook chapters, uh, it turns out that physics, and probably most other domains, if you'll play the same game, is a very lean domain. That, uh, well, there are a lot of topics in physics and lots of textbooks by the time you pile them up uh, uh, to the end of your doctoral degree. But nevertheless, if you just ask, what do I learn in a semester? Or what do I learn in one week when I'm studying one chapter of a book? The answer is four or five things. Not four or five hundred things, but four or five things. I'll give you a dozen, if you don't like four or five as a number. Uh, a, a rather modest number uh, of, uh, of things. And we've been doing this counting. I don't know what a thing is exactly. We, need, we have some worries about what the units ought to be here. But um, uh, the amount of information to be gleaned from that chapter is not overwhelming. Another thing that becomes apparent when you do this is that Textbooks are very explicit about certain things and very coy about telling you about other things. Very secretive, almost, about telling you about other things. Textbooks are great on telling you what the laws of nature are, but they tend to be very inexplicit in telling you when a particular law of nature will be useful for solving a problem, when to apply a particular rule. And that's true not only in physics textbooks, that's true of algebra textbooks. In the chapter in the algebra textbook in which you learn to uh, solve 
a linear algebraic equation in one unknown by adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing both sides by the same number. In the chapter where you learn that, you learn those rules in the first half of the chapter. And then you'll be given a couple of examples which actually solve an equation by applying those rules. But you will not find in any textbook that I know, I'd be pleased if somebody could produce an exception for me, uh, I, you cannot find in any textbook that I know any explicit attention to how you know which of these rules to apply. Uh, and I'll get back to that. But, you know, even as, as uh, simply heuristic as the one we've been given here, that in order to decide which equation to apply, you better ask uh, uh, what givens you have and which equation you can solve. Even some advice like that is not usually given in the textbooks. People seem to acquire it sooner or later. But uh, students are not without their complaints very frequently. That they, they know the rules, but they don't know when to apply them. And they don't understand why that isn't enough. That's inadequate. Well, if they just study production systems a little bit, they'll see that what they've learned are the action sides of the production systems, but they haven't learned are the condition sides of the production systems. And that's typical of textbooks. Textbooks are strong on action sides and very weak on condition sides. I trust if one of you gets around to writing a textbook uh, shortly that you will you'll see, do something about remedying this. By the way, it's my impression, I'm, this is all anecdotal and horseback, it's my impression that there's one class of instructional books that are much better than anything else in this respect, and that is how-to books for physical skills, games, sports, and so on. That they pay more attention, the good ones do, they pay more attention to telling you what clues you should look for. So how do you know you're swinging the tennis racket right? Uh, they're much better on this uh, than uh, most of the books on academic subjects. Uh, I guess some of the chess literature of the last 15 or 20 years, uh, starting with Edward Lasker's little introductory book, have a fair amount of this, but they still could be improved, would you say? You always thought them adequate. Well, that's they're probably yeah. I think if you if you look at them, I think you would find they're very lean on on the cues. Yeah. Yes. Well, maybe the world is, is optimal in that sense, but I really doubt it because you know, large numbers of people never learn how to do this who take physics courses. Now, it is probably true that uh, uh, bright people, whatever that means, uh, that bright people don't need very much of that. I'm prepared to believe that's why Hans there doesn't need very much in his, his chess books. Uh, but uh, it may well be that um, that uh, one of the aspects of what we call intelligence is an individual difference in the ability to search out and add the condition size of production. That's a very wild hypothesis. But I, I, I would not be complacent about the state of textbooks in this respect. I'll, I'll come back to that with respect to the algebra example uh, after, uh, after a little while. Are there other comments or questions on this point? Now, uh, having learned this about these simple kinematics problems and a few other kinds we have, we're under no illusion that we know uh, everything or even very much about the difference between expert and novice performance in physics. A second front on which we are operating is to try to understand uh, what it is that physicists mean when they talk about physical intuition. Um, every physicist has it. <laughs> couldn't solve problems, or you say he has it. Um, and uh, it seems to be very important for, for uh, solving physics problems. Now, this is not peculiar to physicists. In every field, uh, if you ask an expert who has just made a very rapid answer to a question, you ask an ex expert how he did it, he will say, uh, well, I used my intuition. Um, 
they're beginning to get some hold on that, because that's a very alarming term. It's one of those terms which labels a phenomenon without explaining it. And unfortunately, uh, the result of that usually is that it makes the phenomenon go away for certain people, and they don't worry about it anymore when they should be worrying about it. Um, or it creates in people the attitude that if it's all due to intuition, obviously you can't explain it, and therefore why write computer programs or try to get artificial intelligence programs to do those intuitive things. Now I think, pardon? It's magic. it's magic, right. I think some of us who are reductionists and anti-vitalists and all those bad things, uh, some of us think that if anything happens in a human being, it happens through a process. And maybe the process is rapid, as some of the intuitive processes are, but one of our tasks should be to try to explain those processes and not simply to label them. Uh, you remember there was the physician uh, in one of Moliere's plays, I guess in La Malade Imaginaire, uh, who when asked uh, uh, why opium put people to sleep, he said because it has a dormitive faculty. <laughs> that's an explanation on the par with the, uh, with the intuition explanation. Well, what is intuition? First let me talk about intuition in general and then physical intuition. Uh, in a large number of cases where intuition has allegedly been exercised, I don't even have to say allegedly, has been exercised, intuition has been exercised, the evidence for it is that a problem was presented and the expert came up with an answer to that problem very rapidly, uh, maybe in a few seconds. The, don't say instantly because nothing happens in the human nervous system instantly. It's a, really a very poor collection of hardware uh, operating by electrochemical processes. Nothing happens in microseconds, much less nanoseconds. You're lucky if you can get it to turn over in 100 milliseconds to do anything. So, um, so when you say he did it instantly, you mean in a couple of seconds at, at best. And that doesn't sound like instantly to us. We're in the computer business. OK. Uh, I think that most of these phenomena <coughs> can be explained and in a few domains where there has been research done on the subject, have been explained as recognition phenomena. That is to say that if I have a big memory and an adequate index to that memory, an adequate set of access routes to that memory, and if I'm presented an appropriate stimulus, something which that index is capable of recognizing, then uh, I can have a very fast process which will immediately point me to the place in memory where information about that thing is available. And there should be nothing terribly surprising that uh, if I mention uh, a word like diphtheria uh, to a doctor, take a silly example, if I mention a word like diphtheria to a doctor, that he should be able to start right then, that is within these couple of seconds, uh, spewing out information about diphtheria. Or it shouldn't be much more, uh, much more surprising that if he looks at me and sees some peculiar collection of spots on me of an uh, unusual color, uh, that he calls out the name of a disease, which might even turn out to be the disease I actually have. Uh, by the way, uh, these intuitive judgments are not always right. Uh, there's some interesting evidence from chess again, uh, evidence going way back, the work of a Dutch psychologist named Nick Roth, uh, who had some pretty good chess players like Eljechen and others uh, sit in front of a board and, and think aloud while he chose a move. And one of the typical things that happened with grandmasters was that within a couple of seconds, five seconds or so of looking at the board, they had a candidate move. And 95% of the time that turned out to be the right move. But of course the grandmaster, especially if he were in a tournament game, would sit for another 10 or 15 minutes making sure that his intuitions were sound, namely that he had in fact recognize the appropriate cues in that position which sent him to his memory, which said, gee, uh, when cues like that are around, I ought to consider calling the king forth. <laughs> so uh, those aspects of intuition no longer seem to be very, as, very mysterious. Uh, clearly, anybody who spent a long time or any system that spent a long time acquiring information uh, about a lot of things. Uh, if you ask it, and adequately indexed information, if you ask it a question, 
that's within its range of information is apt to give you a very fast answer. Sometimes I can even get answers to questions uh, on the PDP-10 by asking the appropriate help question. If I ask the wrong help question, it flounders around and mutters and doesn't do anything for me. Um, so I'd have to say, by the same evidence I use in the human case, I'd have to say that the PDP-10 uh, exhibits a lot of intuition with regard to some of its own innards, uh, the kinds of programs it has in its memory and so forth and so on. Well, I think physicists mean something more by th than that by physical intuition. <coughs> uh, first, I'll appeal to introspective evidence. Introspective evidence is, it has to be handled a little cagely in psychology because you want science to be public and you want to be able to check up as to whether things people say are really true, or really veridical, and if they're, what they're telling you about are their own, their own inner thoughts, there might be some questions as to whether you can test that by the usual rules of, of science. So I'm not proposing this as, <coughs> as introspection as evidence at the moment, but it might be a good source of ideas nevertheless, which can be followed up by other experimental procedures. Uh, if you ask the expert, see what this program is doing uh, is it's simply taking the problem statement, which actually in this program I'm describing here wasn't in English, but in a sort of a codified English. That doesn't matter. It said the height is 40 meters and the time is question mark. Uh, whether it was in English or not doesn't matter very much. But the uh, system was taking that question and then was simply evoking the right equations and solving those equations. The expert alleged that he wasn't doing that at all. Uh, the expert alleged, this would be more convincing if I had more difficult problems up here, but the expert alleged that what he was doing was reading the problem and understanding it, understanding the physical situation, then writing some equations to represent the physical situation. Now let me indicate what I mean by those two different ways of talking. The one is a problem statement I don't care whether it's in English or in some formalized form, leads to an equation or a set of equations, which then you try to solve. The other is a problem statement leads to some kind of an internal representation of the situation being described in the problem statement. That leads to the construction of some equations, and that leads to a solution. Now again, I don't want to ask why the expert would go this circuitous route rather than the other route, at least I don't want to ask it right now, since this would seem to be more efficient than that. And it may be that on very simple problems, in fact, this does happen. Uh, very hard to get any evidence one way or the other. But as problems get more difficult, it seems pretty evident, and there's even some evidence in the protocols that the second thing is happening. And that implies that people who are expert in doing physics problems do have, in fact, one or more ways of representing physical situations that are not simply the uh, isomorphic to or, or equivalent to, in some sense at least, uh, the set of equations that are to be uh, solved. Now, uh, Gordon Novak in Texas three or four years ago in his doctoral thesis uh, built a system which I think gave a very good suggestion as to what this physical intuition might all be all about. Uh, Novak's program happened to deal with the subject of statics. And it was great for problems where a man is standing on the ladder and the ladder is 12 feet long and the man is two feet from the bottom. He weighs 180 pounds and the ladder, well, you know all those kinds of problems. Um, it did problems of that sort. And how did Novak's program do those problems? Well, first of all, there were in his long-term memory uh, a bunch of schemas, schemas and definitions. A ladder was defined as a lever. A man was defined, well, depending on context, a man was defined as a mass, yeah, kind of minimal definition of a man, but all right for that purpose. Standing on ladders, that's the best way to think of yourself. Certainly don't think of yourself as having wings. Very dangerous. Um, 
So the first thing it did was some translation into a standard set of objects. The second thing it did is it had some schemas which knew all about things like levers and the parts they ought to have. So levers ought to have fulcra or pivots, and levers ought to have uh, forces applied to them, uh, things of that sort. Masses uh, ought to have points of application. Uh, levers ought to have an angle to the horizontal. So there are these schemas, which were, you're all familiar with similar things in other programs, simply a set of slots as to what to expect with a particular set of objects. And then a little program which did two things. First, it instantiated those schemas for the objects that were around in the particular problem. And secondly, uh, it hooked up an appropriate collection of schemas to represent that specific problem. Uh, it took the, the uh, instantiated schema, which was the man, and the instantiated schema, which was the ladder, and it set the man on the ladder and, and uh, represented the pivot point, uh, the, the point of, of contact between the two of them, uh, and so on. And I think we would be inclined to argue that this intermediate diagram is probably not very different from what the physicist means when he says he forms a physical representation of the problem before writing the equation. Furthermore, in a problem like the one I've just been describing to you, it becomes pretty apparent why he'd want to do that. If you just have a single situation with a single set of variables relating to that situation, it's all very well to talk about going directly from a verbal description of it to a set of equations. But if you have a bunch of objects in relation to each other and so forth and so on, then you're going to have to some way of assembling the whole set of relations that have to be represented by the equations. And going through this intermediate step of forming a physical representation seems to be a good way of doing that. Uh, <coughs> we are now building programs which do that. Uh, Jill Larkin has a rather interesting program, a general one, which I might say a word about if I have time. Well, we'll see when I have time. Um, and we're trying to learn more now in detail about the nature of those physical representations, how abstract or concrete they are, uh, what range of schemas the, the uh, expert has to have around, and how he makes use of those uh, schemas. In this particular case, it has proved to be, on the whole, uh, easier to write computer programs representing these things or simulating these things than it has to get direct evidence uh, of uh, the nature of the schemas that human beings use. That's very elusive um, because you, you, can't, you can't ask a human being outright, well, how are you representing that situation? And expect to get a sensible answer. The answer, first of all, has to be in words. Uh, and that may involve a rather horrendous translation from a structure which isn't verbal and which certainly is not isomorphic to a verbal string. So uh, I guess I would welcome uh, suggestions now or later as to how one gets any kind of evidence from human subjects as to the nature of the physical representations they are using. We get some kind of indirect evidence. Uh, a few years back, we ran the following problem on algebra, uh, the, the following kinds of problems. Um, some of you have heard this to the point of nausea, I'm sure, but I'll use the example again. Uh, a man uh, had a board which he sawed into two parts. Uh, the first part was two-thirds the length of the board. The second part was four feet longer than the first. How long was the board? You all got the answer? It's no good. No good, OK. What's no good about it? Not self-consistent. Well, let me say it again. A man had a board which he cut into two parts. First part was 2 thirds of the length of the board. Second part was 4 feet longer than the first. How long was the board? I can write an equation for that. The equation will be 2 thirds x plus 2 thirds x plus 4 equals x. And I'll anticipate you. What's, what's inconsistent about that? <laughs> All right. So what's, 
There's nothing internally inconsistent about this. It's inconsistent with additional information we have in memory about real Bohr. So here's some evidence. Now, when we gave this to subjects at various levels of proficiency in math, physics, et cetera, et cetera, we, our subjects fell into three groups and rather consistently over a whole set of problems. One set of subjects, uh, or we were asking them to write the equations but not to solve them, okay? One set of subjects would write this equation. Another set of subjects would write, for a problem like this, this equation. They'd write a minus sign instead of a plus sign. And a third set of subjects would respond as you did and say there's an inconsistency. Now, that gives you some very strong evidence about what's going on. It says that the first set of subjects were, uh, were proceeding purely syntactically. They took that sentence and they translated it into an algebraic equation with the way you might translate English into French. The second set of subjects, well, they weren't quite so good with their grammar. Uh, they must have formed some sort of a physical representation and then put in whichever algebraic sign did the most good there. <laughs> so they must have had a semantic representation. Or else they were guessing. Although on a large number of these problems where we've done this, where people have changed the equation, they've always changed it from a physically impossible form to a physically possible form. I don't think we've had any exception to that. And we never see the reverse action. And then the third set of subjects evidently did a careful job of parsing and constructed a physical representation and found this inconsistency between the two. So uh, you can get this kind of indirect inf uh, information about um, physical representations. We did not have a big enough uh, uh, sample of subjects for me to say what I'm going to say next. but. Uh, extrapolating from tiny samples, uh, it turns out that physicists and engineers uh, belong to the second or third classes. They either write a minus sign here or they object. Uh, whereas pure mathematicians uh, <laughs> write that. <laughs> no. No. Oh, we didn't ask them to solve it because we wanted to give them a series of these. We thought the game would be up after the first one. It's not clear that the game would have been up after the first one, <laughs> but we didn't want to take the chance. Yeah. No, we didn't ask them to solve it. 